Hey everyone, it's Ryan with The Smart House. And on today's video, we're gonna be doing another in our series of getting started with Home Assistant. So I've had a number of viewers in both the comments on these YouTube videos and in my Discord server asking questions on this specific subject. Now these users have encountered problems when adding new integrations to their Home Assistant instance that don't use the new UI function. They stumble across something that all beginners dread, code. They look up a new integration that fits a device in their house, and then they're presented with a block of code, some files they don't recognize, and then they give up. Never fear, because in today's video, we're gonna take a look at the fundamental configuration building block of Home Assistant, YAML. Now, I wanted to title the video, YAML Basics, or how I learned to stop worrying and love code, but I figured a lot of people wouldn't get it, and it won't fit in YouTube's title length restrictions. So in today's video, I'm gonna to explain to you some of the syntax or how YAML code is formatted and how Home Assistant specifically uses it. So by the end of this video, you'll know the basics of YAML, how it's formatted, and how you can clean up your Home Assistant configuration files to make it both more secure and easier to read. So let's take a look at what is YAML. All right, so let's start at the beginning. So YAML stands for yet another markup language. Now, this is a coding language, um, configuration language that's been around since 2001. It's actually very similar to XML if you've used it, but it's a little lighter weight. To, it's primarily used to bring a custom configuration into an application when it starts up. So this is used in Oracle and other systems where you wanna read a configuration out of a file and dump it into a application that's gonna start up. Now, Home Assistant chose this one, I believe, because it's fairly lightweight and it doesn't require a lot of additional syntax except for the items I'm gonna cover here in just a second. So let's talk about the structure and syntax of YAML. Now, please don't fall asleep. I will make this section as quick as possible and I've got some examples that I've taken from the Home Assistant documentation, but I'll take you through them in each step so you understand what they mean. So most of you don't know, but I really like to diagram and show uh, people examples on a whiteboard. The unfortunate thing is one, I'm left-handed, so it's really hard for me to write on a whiteboard. Two, my handwriting is terrible. And three, I cannot draw worth a darn. I'm gonna be using some paper printed out versions of the code to show you the examples as we move through today. So the, the main form of syntax or code format that there is in YAML is the indent. And in YAML, the indent is two spaces. So what this means is if you look at a structure of code, each hierarchy is designated by double spaces. So each double space is moving one step down the hierarchy. Now, one thing to note is YAML does not accept a tab character. So if you were to say, open up a YAML document in Notepad on Windows and insert your code and put a tab in instead of a double space, if you save that and try to execute it, you'll get an error message in Home Assistant. This is because it doesn't accept that tab format. If you use a modern code editor like VS Code or even uh, Notepad++, it will disable tabs entirely and replace every tab with two spaces. So keep that in mind as you're editing your file for the first time. If you're using something basic like Notepad, make sure you're following the rules of using spaces and not tabs. But if you're using a different one, it will call it out or replace it automatically. So for this first example, these are basically what you're gonna see anytime you run across a documentation. It'll be a small snippet of code with a specific platform called out so this is designed for a single giant configuration.yaml, which is a fine thing to do, but later on in the video, we'll talk about why you might wanna split this up into smaller chunks, and I'll show you how to interpret these type of commands if you have a split configuration. But for now, we're just gonna go through as if this is just a section in your configuration. So say you wanted to add the push bullet notifier, and again, this is now in the UI, but this is still a good example. So we've got the notifier platform. So if I put a line down here, this indicates this is the left side. So there is no space here. The, the platform callout or integration callout is all the way to the left. It's the first item in the line. We want to define the platform. So we'll bring in the platform, but you'll notice this is an indent and this indent is two spaces to move it over in the hierarchy. Now you'll notice this does not have quotation marks on it. And that is because it's defining a known platform in the system, it's not a variable, which we'll get to the quotes here a little bit later. So again, now we move on to the next value and it has two spaces in front of it. Of course, these have a space in between. So this is a value. So how things are defined in YAML is you have a key and a value, and those are separated by a colon. This is typical in things like JSON or other platforms. But just remember, every time you define something, you have to have a key and then a value. 
and we'll go a little bit into some of the pitfalls you can have with quotes a little bit later in the video. So then finally, we do two more spaces and we define the name, also push bullet. So in this case, this string doesn't have to, but you can put quotes on here because it, it can be given a name. So you could name this push bullet, you can name it whatever you want to do. So as we see here, anytime you define something, the first line or the first section of a new integration is always gonna be the integration or platform name. Then the next line down is every definition under that, every key under that. There's a basic introduction into YAML code. We've looked at what our indents look like. We've looked at what is a platform or integration. And we've also defined the key and variable pairs that are required as you go through a YAML code. So let's move to a slightly different code. This will have multiple callouts under the same platform. Now we're gonna introduce a new element into our YAML setup here, and that's collections, which is the hyphen you see here. So again, our integration is sensor. So then we go down to the next step. And since we're under sensor, we've got two spaces here. And then you'll notice we now have a hyphen in the mix. This hyphen indicates a list or collection of items. So if you have a large number of sensors, each one of those sensor headers are gonna start with a hyphen platform. So you could have hyphen platform MQTT, template, anything as you go down, you have to have that hyphen indicating that there's a list of items that we're going down through. So in this case, we've got platform is MQTT. Under that, this is the state topic example here of sensor topic. So again, here, we've gotta go four spaces in because now we are under the platform MQTT. And one quick tip to notice, if you're using a more modern editor, it'll be using a type of font that has equal sized letters. So you will always be able to tell your alignment by where it lines up. So now if you notice, this hyphen is directly under the N and that's two letters in. So that's your two white space, your two spaces there hyphen platform MQTT. Then this one lines up directly under the P, the S under the P, because there's four spaces here, because you've got one, two, three, four, because this is actually, there's actually a space here too. So now we'll define the next sensor, which is also an MQTT platform under here. So again, we've got two spaces and then our hyphen showing our next element in the list as platform MQTT directly below that. Again, we've got state topic, with four spaces in front of it, and then our next sensor value, which is defined over here. So again, this is an example of having a set a collection in your list of items. So again, no matter what it is, whether it's sensors, notify binary sensors, you're gonna have a hyphen at the beginning of each of these platforms because you've got multiple entries heading down your YAML file. In our last example, we only had a single platform, so we didn't need that because we didn't have a list. So anytime you're gonna have a list of items, you're gonna to need to have a hyphen in front of it. So now onto our last example, we're gonna introduce a few more elements and kind of combine everything together. So for this example, we're gonna be defining an input select. Now again, this has been transferred into the UI, but you can still define it in the YAML code. So it's just a good example that has all these elements pulled together into one. So again, we have our platform definition at the top, no spaces to the left. We come down to where it will define the actual name of the entity of the input select. So we have to have two spaces in front of that. This is an example, if we had more than one entity here, we'd have to use a hyphen, but since we only have one, we're not gonna use a hyphen. We move down inside the, to the next level over, and that's why we need four spaces here, so we can define the friendly name of this input select. Now, say I wanted to add a note here to myself that I could read later on while I'm coding. If I wanted to stick this note here, this would cause a syntax error because this is not a valid key here. However, if you wanted to add something, all you gotta do is throw a hashtag in front of it, or as we olds call it, a pound sign. And in this case, it doesn't matter if there's spaces in front of it or not because it's a comment block. As soon as the interpreter comes across this pound sign, it's gonna say, this doesn't matter, I don't need to read the rest of this line, move on to the next one. So you can include a comment at the end of a line, on its own line, either way, as soon as it hits that, hashed sign, it's going to stop interpreting the code and it's going to move on to the next line. So in this case, since it's under here, we have four spaces in front of it, but that's entirely optional because again, it's not going to actually be interpreted by the interpreter. It's going to skip that and continue on. So next we have to define our options for this input select. And since it is a parameter that's under the same entity called threat, 
it's gonna be in line with the line above it. So again, since this line's a comment, it doesn't matter. But because these are under the threat hierarchy, then there, these two will be, the name and the options will be on the same line. So again, this requires four spaces in front of it. And now we're gonna define the options. So then we're gonna bring in another one of our collections. So now we have another list here. So because we have a list, we have to use our hyphens. And since this list is under the key of options, we have to indent it to one more. So in this case, there are six spaces here. And that's the case for each of these lines as you go down. Because again, you're moving into the hierarchy, you have to have six spaces there. So again, you wanna make sure that the hyphen lines up with the third letter in the word, and then that's how you know you're in that particular column. So then finally, we have another thing that we're defining. This, this is another requirement for the input select. And since this is not part of the options subheader, it moves back out again. So in this case, it's got four spaces in front of it. So if we look at the actual code, it's a little bit easier to see than it is here on the whiteboard that you've got the first element, which is the input select, the second element, which is threat, everything is under that, then you move to the third level of hierarchy, and that's where the options are defined for this element. You've got name, options, and initial. And then the fourth hierarchy is showing under the options. And then finally, we've also introduced a comment. So again, you could place the comments anywhere you want in your line, and it's good practice to add comments. So when you go back to try to figure out what you meant, you don't have issues understanding why you wrote it that way. So before we move on to the next section, there was a, there's a couple of elements that I wanna point out that are important to understand about YAML. The first one being letter case. Now, YAML interprets uppercase and lowercase as different characters. So if you were to say have a sensor called sensor oven with a lowercase, this does not equal sensor oven with an uppercase. So if you were to use, define a sensor using all lowercase characters, and then later on reference that sensor, but you have an uppercase character, it's not gonna work. It's gonna error out because this is a different sensor than this over here. So make sure you keep it consistent. I like to use all lowercase when defining my characters in the YAML, just so we don't run into that problem. And on that subject, let's talk about our final tip in this case is how is making sure you use consistent quotations throughout your environment. Now you can nest quotations. So if you look at my first example here, we have a single quotation on the front first and ending to put that whole section in quotations. You'll notice that my on has double quotes around it. Now this is correct and this is completely acceptable. So you can get away with this. Also, you can get away with having double quotes on the outside and single quotes on the inside because they're matched correctly. Now, if you look at our third example here, we use a single quote and then we use a single quote again here on the on. This is gonna cause the interpreter to see this whole section here in quotes and then it's going to see the word on out of quotes and it's gonna cause an error message. So this was incorrect, you shouldn't do it this way. This, is, this last example is one I see a lot of people get tripped up on. If you use the same quotes throughout the, ent the entire thing, whether it's single quotes or double quotes, all the way through there. So you put double quotes on the outside here to start, and then you put double quotes around your on, and then double quotes at the end. Again, the interpreter is gonna see this is the beginning of your quotation area, and this is the end. Then it's gonna see these in quotations. So it's gonna find this on outside of quotations it's not gonna know what to do with. So again, when you are having nested quotations, make sure you start and stop them correctly. You need to make sure you use it in the correct order because it won't know where it stops and where it starts. So make sure you select one style. So if you wanted to have your outside quotes always be single quotes and then your inside quotes be double quotes, that's fine. Just pick a standard and stick with it. All right, so now that we've seen some of the ins and outs of the YAML language, so now we've seen some examples of the YAML language and how it's used, let's hop back onto the computer and we'll take a look at how it applies specifically in Home Assistant and how Home Assistant's hierarchy works with a split configuration. All right, so for this next section, let's take a look at how Home Assistant specifically uses YAML and how to split up your configuration file. Now, Home Assistant has a great article, it may be a little outdated, but on how to split up a configuration file and talking about the core structures of their YAML configurations. I'll take you through the configuration file for my test environment, 
will go ahead and split off a couple of sections into their own files, and then we'll talk about the secrets.yaml section. So if we hop over into my Visual Studio code for my configuration.yaml on my test environment. So I actually created this one um, a couple, about probably a year ago. The older version configuration.yaml file was a little bit different. Now I believe if you start today, you already get a partially split configuration file. Things like your groups, automation, scripts, scenes, sensors, switches, input booleans, and uh, binary sensors all already come with a file with an old configuration.yaml, or if you are splitting off one you found before, this would be a good method to help you out. So starting with our configuration.yaml, we'll notice I've got a large section of cameras, and I've also got a large section for the rest command here. So if we look, how it works is we have our integration up here. So like in our examples, notify, things like that two spots and you'll see here, this is why using a more modern editor like VS Code helps because it shows you the spaces that are here, making sure you're lined up. So if I scroll all the way to the bottom here, you'll notice that I've got a few of these with an include here. So how this works is, so when YAML sees this exclamation point, it calls out a command. It's telling it to include a groups.yaml file. And if we look at my configuration here, you'll see there's a whole series of files in the same folder as my configuration.yaml. So in this case, it's calling out for the group integration. It wants to include the groups.yaml. So it's gonna call out this groups.yaml file and then parse it down and then move to the next line. So if you look at my sensors over here, so I'll bring up the sensors.yaml, now there's a whole series of files under here that would be in my normal configuration.yaml, but that would just clutter things. So if we notice on this one, because we're already under the sensors integration, the first line is the hyphen. So we can see each to the far left is a hyphen, and then two spaces, and then it starts each one. So, so we use the same example we did on the whiteboard. We'll see this push bullet. If we wanna pull this in as a sensor, you'll notice that it's called out the sensor, and then it's gonna give you something, it's gonna give you the rest of the code. Now, if you were to grab this, copy it, and paste it into your sensors.yaml, you are actually not within syntax. If you look, it's gonna give you an error message. That's because it already included the indent. So you can remove that indent, shift everything over two spaces, and then you'll be set. So that's how when you wanna grab code off of an example, off of the documentation, if you were to grab it with all the indents in there, it's gonna fail because it, it's assuming you're pasting this into your configuration.yaml. But when you paste it into a, a separate YAML file for say sensors, you need to remove left two spaces off of everything, shift it over one so it, it matches up with the items above. And this is one of the issues a lot of new users run into is they'll grab that snippet of code, paste it, and then they'll run into errors and give up. If you wanted to create a new one, so let's, I'm gonna go ahead and create one called for camera, and then I'm gonna include camera YAML. Now you'll notice in VS Code, it's gonna give me this duplicate key error. That's because I already have a camera section defined here. Now one thing to note is if you do have duplicates in here, it's always gonna take the last key, the last integration. Um, it may even error out, but it will always take the last one because it's gonna read it and it's gonna overwrite your existing cameras. But it's always a good idea to get rid of the duplicate key. So now I'm gonna take all of my code from here, remove it, remove the camera, integration, and then we'll go over and we'll create a new file and call this one camera. Now, when I paste my code in here, everything is going to be two spaces to the right too far. So obviously I could go through here and erase those two spaces, but in most modern editors, you can hold down shift and tab and it will bump everything over one indentation. So there we go, now everything is lined up correctly. The hyphens are all the way to the left. So this should when I save it and check it, everything should be good. So let's go back to the configuration.yaml and we're gonna go ahead and do the same thing for the rest command. So I'm gonna grab everything under the rest command and you'll notice there's only one entity I'm defining, so there's no hyphen here. So let's grab all this, cut, and then I'm going to remove the white space here and we'll say include rest command.yaml. Again, we'll go create a new file, call this rest underscore command dot yaml and we'll paste the code in and again our indent is in there so we'll go ahead and remove that shift everything over to the left and then hit save so now we have a much simpler configuration and it's much easier to jump into the right section to make the edits you want to make and obviously to check this you go to configuration go down to server controls which looks different this is still running an old version and then you hit check configuration and this is going to make sure your configuration is valid if you get no errors when you restart it home assistant won't freak out so you know everything's good 
right, for this last piece, let's talk about secrets.yaml. So if I hop into my sensors, you'll notice right here, I've got a secret definition. So very similar to how the include works, where you use the exclamation point include, when you use the tag exclamation secret, it's going to look into a specific file and look for a key to bring in and replace this variable. So in my case, there's a secret and it's gonna look for this key switchbot underscore API. So if I open up my secrets.yaml, you'll notice these again are all lined up to the far left hand side and you'll see these are the keys it's gonna look for. So what's gonna happen when it hits that exclamation point secret, it's gonna then pop into the secrets.yaml file and search for that key. So obviously these two need to be identical. These keys need to be identical because it's gonna have to search it out. It's gonna come down here, find this, and then it will insert everything to the right back in to the configuration as it loads. Now, the biggest reason you wanna do this is say you wanna get help and you post either in the forum or on a Discord server. The first thing they're gonna ask you is to send us your configuration so we can read through your code to make sure everything looks good. Now, obviously, if you copy and paste that, it's gonna contain things like passwords and API keys, and that's not a good idea, and you'll typically be asked to delete your file if you do that. So if you use the secrets.yaml, you can actually upload your entire configuration except for the secret file, and then people can be able to help you with it. Or if you wanna share this example with a friend, you can do that without exposing all of your passwords. So it's a good idea, and it's now set up by default in Home Assistant to load that secrets.yaml in there. Say I wanted to keep this IP address safe. So I'm gonna go ahead and put it on my clipboard. We'll type in exclamation point secret, and then we'll give it a, we'll call it a Xiaomi IP. Now I'll go into my secrets.yaml, go down to the bottom here, and we'll do Xiaomi IP. And then we'll paste in the IP address. And again, once we save that, it will grab that when it loads the configuration into Home Assistant and replace it with the IP address. Therefore, if I share this out, I don't have to give out any information. So there you go. That's how in Home Assistant, you can take an existing configuration and split it up. Now we've seen how the include works. There are some more advanced features like include directory, where instead of including an individual file, you can actually tell it to include an entire directory. So if you wanted to split your configuration even further, like you had auto Automations, you wanted to split them into separate automation files, you can do that, but that's a more advanced topic that we may cover in the future. So we now see how to split a configuration file up. We've talked about using the include tag. We've talked about taking an existing file and then making a new YAML file to keep things clean and organized. And I've shown you how to use the secrets.yaml. So if you do run into any questions on these, please make sure you join the Discord server or leave a comment here below. All right, so there we go. Hopefully you found this basics video helpful. Even if you've never used YAML before, I hope you've learned something new. Now I plan to have more of these basics videos each month in 2022. So if there's a topic that you wanna see, please leave it in the comments below. Now I know I have an MQTT basics video in the works because that's been a popular question that I've received. Now, if you'd like to see more Home Assistant basics videos, click on the playlist right here. If you'd like to let the algorithm select the next video for you, click up here. Now, as always, if you haven't already, please make sure you subscribe to the channel by clicking our logo right here. So thank you again for joining us on today's video, and I hope to see you next week for another video. Have a great week.